Hi, everyone. Welcome to JLive. I'm J Arts Collaborations Manager, Sarah Gardner, and it's great to be with you for JLive. JLive is our series of virtual cultural experiences that bring us together to explore and celebrate the diverse world of Jewish art, culture, and creative expression. In JLive Food, we're bringing you bite-sized conversations and cooking demos with the best Boston area chefs. Today, I'm so excited to welcome award-winning chef, Chef Michael Leviton, um, who also happens to be the chair of Taste of Israel, Israeli Restaurant Week 2020. He'll be sharing with us a delicious couple of recipes inspired by his time in Martha's Vineyard and in Israel. Um, we'll be sending out the recipes afterward. If you have questions during the conversation, please share them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and I will ask as many as time allows at the end of this segment. Um, so thank you so much for being here, Michael. Please take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So for most of the past month, I've um, been on the vineyard taking advantage of a uh, unique opportunity to um, get, uh, get away and spend that much time uh, with, with the family while, you know, normally they'd be at camp and such. Um, so this summer, don't really want to cook a lot. It's, you know, 90 degrees here and about a thousand percent humidity. Um, so, you know, anything I can do to stay out of the kitchen is uh, great for me and I'm assuming for you as well. So we're doing a lot of um, sort of, you know, entree size salads and um, that very often looks like whatever we found at the farmer's market with a piece of fish on top. And in thinking about this and the time of year and going to um, Morning Glory Farm um, so many times, um, what struck me was uh, a, a lot of things that would enable me to make something that is basically um, somewhere between uh, a mishmash of fatouche, um, of a Lebanese um, tomato salad with toasted pita, cucumber, onion, some parsley, purslane, things like that, and a really sort of citrusy, um, spicy vinaigrette, something between that and um, the salad niçoise. Um, and so it's that sort of idea put through the lens of what was available um, at the farm and at the uh, fishmongers this morning. Um, so with that in mind, um, my mise en place here, um, we have some tomatoes, first of the season, um, some Romanesco broccoli or broccoli Romanesco, uh, which is the one thing sort of that I have cooked uh, roasted it, um, very simple, olive oil, salt and pepper, 14 minutes in the oven at 500 degrees and you get that wonderful little bit of uh, light char, deeply roasted flavor, brings out, um, you know, gives you that nuttiness and then also softens the bitterness of, uh, of the, the Romanesco. Uh, I have some jicama here, not jicama, um, kohlrabi here because I like the watery crunch some beautiful uh, slices of purple pepper, green and yellow beans blanched uh, for just about five minutes. Uh, I would say there's a recipe for that, but it really with, the, with, with those sorts of things, excuse me, that's one. Yeah. Okay, those are our instant pita chips. Um, so for the beans, the thing to remember is um, cooking it in super salty water. So literally, you want it to taste like the North Atlantic. That's going to be about uh, one cup of salt per gallon of water. I know it tastes really salty, but it's not, and it's going to give you uh, a wonderful flavor to your beans, help set the color as well, and then you're going to drop them into ice water. Um, I generally start the timer at about three and a half minutes and then stand over the pot tasting until I think, okay, now we're ready. Uh, I have some different squashes um, here that I slice really, really thin. And here we're gonna use the magic of cooking by not cooking. Uh, cucumbers, radishes, because I love the heat and the, the crunchy pop, some parsley. And because it's been so hot and sunny and we haven't had a lot of rain, there's basically no baby greens on the island right now. So I've got some more adolescent kale, which, uh, or red Russian kale, which I've just kind of chopped up and that'll be the base of our salad. So in the spirit of cooking by not cooking, 
We're going to marinate uh, this zucchini and squash very simply. Fairly uh, generous amount of salt because what you're going to be doing is pulling water out. Um, a little bit of lemon juice. A little pinch of sumac. Sumac gives you a wonderful uh, sort of citrusy punch. And one of my favorite things, Aleppo pepper. Really uh, nice, not too hot, but super fragrant. Uh, I'm do that. And now just a little shot of olive oil. And we'll mix this very well. And those will soften very quickly. If you were to cut them larger, you'd want to give them a little more marination time. Um. And Michael, I have a quick question for you, actually, as you're um, marinating those. Yep. Do you have a particular brand of sumac that you like or a particular place you like to buy it? Um, yes, and I'm blanking. Um, Curio Spice on Mass Ave in um, Somerville. Yeah, it's a Somerville place. Great. Right. Yeah, uh, they have awesome, awesome spices. Um, if you don't, you know, get from um, from uh, from elsewhere. Um, I have some nuts because I get uh, some toasted almonds. Again, I, I like a lot of different crunchy elements. Um, and I actually do have a piece of bass that I roasted already, but what I wanted here um, was nice crispy skin and then a very gently cooked um, flesh. I'll show you how to do that as well, but you know, I pulled one of the, uh, uh, as I like to say, the, the through the magic of television that Julia Child always used to do, you know, she puts a raw turkey in and two seconds later out it comes. Um, some capers, uh, a little bit of brine olives would be great here as well. Um, we have some pita chips that I just made. Um, one of my favorite things, uh, Sharona's Pita Bread Factory Pita. I don't know if you can see that. Um, the only place I know to get it is Wilson Farm in, um, in Lexington, but it's really wonderfully thick and, and doughy and absolutely delicious. So if you can find it, I totally recommend it. Um, to dress this salad. Um, the recipe that you're gonna get uh, um, afterwards is for a, a lemon sumac uh, Aleppo, um, Aleppo vinaigrette. But if you take the spices out of it, what you're gonna have is a wonderful basic lemon vinaigrette that becomes, uh, at least at my house and at Lumiere and Area 4 and elsewhere was sort of the de facto house vinaigrette. So, the, the big move in doing that is making our own lemon oil um, to, you know, I, I always want to fully utilize everything and the zest of the lemon gives you a wonderful perfumey sweet lemon flavor that you don't get from lemon juice. So we would microplane a whole mess of um, lemons, take that zest, cover it with neutral uh, oil. So cottonseed, grapeseed, canola, and very gently bring it up to about 200 degrees and then let it steep. And then the next day, or once it's cool, strain that out. And now you have a really wonderfully aromatic and lightly lemony sweet um, oil that provides another layer of lemon flavor when you start adding lemon juice and a little bit of red wine vinegar to the whole ensemble. The other thing in that vinaigrette is the use of a little bit of red wine vinegar so that we have um, more than one acid going on because those acids hit you, um, hit your palate at different points. So as opposed to just having something that was purely straightforward lemon, I want the, the, the rounder punch of the, uh, the red wine vinegar and then the sweetness that the lemon oil would give. Um, and then it's I have a question to that actually from our, one of our audience members. Um, I, 
they said that they hear that pomegranate molasses is the secret to fatouche. Do you use it in this kind of variety of vinegars and, and flavorings in this dressing? Right, but that's an interesting, uh, interesting way to do it. Um, right. You know, I think that, in, in, and so in, it would give it a certain sweetness that I wouldn't ordinarily think of. Um, what I like for the, the added sort of um, acid or, or lemony flavor in the fatouche dressing is the sumac, right? So now you have the red wine vinegar, the lemon, the lemon oil, and the sumac, which all contribute slightly different citrusy notes to the whole equation. That's awesome. And just kind of a question to that, like you are saying all of these amazing, wonderful words, sumac, fatouche, Aleppo pepper, all of these seasonings and flavors. Um, how did you get into this style of cooking? I mean, this is what a lot of people know as Israeli cooking, but how, what is your connection to it? How did you come to know? That, you know, no, I, I, I was very, very fortunate uh, 30 something years ago to, um, work uh, with Joyce Goldstein uh, at Square One years ago. She's now written dozens of cookbooks. Um, she is a maven on everything food related. Um, and when I worked for her, it was the name of the restaurant was Square One. And the amazing thing was that the menu changed entirely every day. And so we got exposed to a world of different flavors um, and learned how to you know, how to deal with them. Um, and so it was really interesting, you know, you would see cilantro in a lot of different um, incarnations and you realize, oh, it's not just Mexican, it's also, you see it in Asian food and now you, you also see it in Middle Eastern food, right? And so this same ingredient does a lot of different things in different cuisines. Um, and so, you know, ever since then, I've been fascinated by, and the one thing that I will say about Joyce is, all of those flavors are big and bold, and they are designed to, um, at the same time that they punch you in the face, Joyce always talks about um, uh, food being sexy, right? And so the flavors need to be sexy. Um, and so that always meant, you know, olives and capers and anchovies and, um, you know, big, big olive oils, um, the, the spices, you know, uh, that, we're, that we're using today, those sorts of things, um, I saw that from the beginning. Um, okay. The recent trips I've done to Israel, and especially the one that um, Laura and uh, Tony Maas and I took a few years ago, which was just eating uh, and drinking, um, just exposed us to a, a, a whole world of Israeli or not even I don't even want to say Israeli because it was really it was Jewish food and it was Middle Eastern food that be, I think that becomes Israeli food because you have um, you have traditional foods from all of the uh, cultures and countries in the Middle East there and then you also have the um, traditional foods from every other Jewish culture on the planet that has come to Israel uh, um, post 48. And now you have that even mixed in with all of these young Israelis traveling to the four corners of the globe after they get out of the army and bringing those things back. And so you have, you know, really this, this unbelievable, um, to totally overuse the, the phrase, but this unbelievable melting pot of flavors and cultures and techniques from everywhere. Um, the one thing that I will say about, uh, or one of the things I'll say about um, the last couple of trips to Israel was really, um, I think, understanding a lot more about spices, right? I used to want to use uh, a lot of herbs, but not a, not, a, not a ton of spice. And I think over the past few trips, I've become more, more interested and more intrigued by um, the spices and then the spice blends that um, really form the backbone of, of a lot of the, uh, the traditional cuisines there. Right, right. And thus we have Aleppo pepper. And right, Aleppo and sumac. And then, um, right. you know, uh, I didn't bring it, but uh, uh, I'm also a huge fan of Urfa pepper, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, um, a much darker, deeper um, flavor. And so really mixing these these different peppers to give you a variety of heats, just as you, um, 
just as I was talking about using a variety of um, acids in your in your cooking, right? And so I'm thinking even now, you know, we I used to make this gazpacho, and we we called it the magic acid blend, and it was actually lemon, um, lime, a little sherry vinegar, and a hint of orange, right? But when you put all of those together, as opposed to just one of them, the flavor was so much rounder and bolder, and to use Joyce's word, a heck of a lot sexier. Right. So, all right. Now that we've sort of now that we've gone on that tangent, let's go back yeah. to the recipe at hand. Yes. Um. All right. So these are now nicely getting uh, tender. Again, if you were to give them, you know, a little more time, they'd really soften up even more. Um. I think the thing we need to do now is to walk over. Um. We have some striped bass over here. Um, tis the season here in Martha's Vineyard. The stripers are definitely running, and this is what you want to be eating right now. Um, I've had them on a uh, paper towel. I really wanted to dry out the skin. I'm going to cook this almost unilaterally, one side, um, on the skin to really get that, to render out some of the, the fat underneath the skin, the subcutaneous fat, so that I can have a really nice, crispy skin. Um, experience. Also, you know, a lot of salt here, it, or it seems like a lot of salt, it really isn't, but the crispy salty skin is a wonderful treat. Um, while we're at it, pepper mill. If you have store-bought pre-ground um, black pepper in your, um, in your pantry, please get rid of it. it tastes like junk. You'll you know use the fresh stuff. It's not that difficult, and it'll taste a heck of a lot better. Um, no feelings here, folks. <laughs> uh, Amazing. Well, Michael, while you're doing that, um, I have another question from our audience about harissa. Do you use nope. harissa? Uh, yeah, I, I've got a very long and complicated recipe for uh, for for making it. Um, but it's absolutely wonderful. Amazing. Going uh, to your point. No, of it's a good thing. Good, it'll, it'll stay forever in your fridge pretty much. So if you make a big batch, you know, just pack it away and you can drizzle it on everything. Amazing. That's great. And I'm, you know, I'm curious, a lot of um, the experiences that you've talked about um, while you're cooking here have to do with kind of like the diversity of flavors across the Jewish diaspora. I mean, like Joyce Goldstein, if I'm, if I'm thinking of the right Joyce Goldstein, she's, she's the author of like Cucina Hebraica and um, Sephardic yeah. flavors, and, you know, right. some of the seminal cookbooks uh, of Jewish food. Um, so I'm curious, you know, how does this relate to your Jewish identity, if at all? And, and has this informed, has your foray in the culinary world informed how you think about being Jewish? Um. This is a, 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 uh, a tough question. Um, I find that it is easiest for me to connect with Judaism through food and, you know, the, the, the everything, all of the cultural aspects attached to food from just the sense of community, right? The easiest way to get people talking is to put some food and perhaps a bottle of wine down between them. That will immediately start a conversation. Um, but also the notion of, you know, these are the traditions where we come from. Um, and because of my, you know, um, not so mild obsession with food, um, it's a really easy, um, place to stick the harpoon in, so to speak. Um, and one where I particularly identify, um, I often say sometimes that I don't have the religious gene. Um, the um, services and a lot of the, the other things don't really do it for me, and I don't identify in that regard. But the food is one of those things where I absolutely um, connect and want to dive that much more deeply uh, into. Right. Right. And you've had so many amazing experiences. It's sort of like, for you, it's more like foodism than Judaism, if you pardon the terrible. Ah, terrible. Oh, right, right on. <laughs> yes, we have to use that now. Right. Just actually, right here. 
I think that's, that's part of going to be, we'll, we'll have to weave that tagline into um, uh, Israeli food, you know, uh, yeah. Israel, right? Yes, totally. And I, I would love, I mean, as, you, as you're cooking, if you don't mind, just telling our audience a little bit about your involvement with Taste of Israel and how you, how you came to be the chair of Israeli Restaurant Week. It's a big position. Uh, um, so th is, uh, that all came out of that trip that, that Tony Maas of, of Craigie um, on Main um, and Laura, who, who runs J Arts, uh, we all took a few years ago. And, you know, we were so struck by trying to understand what that question of what is Israeli cuisine, you know, and, and so the, the Michael Solomonov um, documentary and, and uh, is awesome, but I felt, I felt I got a sort of different um, experience out of it. And, you know, I'm still kind of trying to wrestle with that notion of, I, I don't know that you can necessarily define it as definitively Israeli, um, one way or the other, right? There's, it's Jewish, right? Because it's cooked by Jews. It's Middle Eastern because of where it is. It's Jewish because of, you know, er, er, everything that everyone brought back from the diaspora when they came back to Israel. Um, and, you know, now you have, as I said, these other global influences and, but to say one thing is particularly Israeli, I don't know, right? Um, and so I, what the hope with Taste of Israel is to give everybody a sense of this really unique and wonderful amalgamation that, for lack of a better term, and I'm clearly lacking a better term, but for lack of a better term is Israeli cuisine as we see it now, right? Um, or at least as I see it. It's not just, you know, Israeli salad, hummus, and pita, right? That's not it. That's not enough. It's way more diverse and way more exciting um, than that. You know, I think one of the things that I was most fascinated with, with when I was there um, was Yemenite food, right? I mean, just unbelievable layers of flavor, um, really interesting iteration, you know. Um, Joyce would often talk about the uh, cucina povera, uh, so poverty cuisine, right? Well, what is that in the Middle East? How does that look like, right? And so how do you take these incredibly humble ingredients and, and make them sing? Right. Um, and, and then I feel like what you're doing also is just like showing us today exactly like how to integrate those just kind of into our day-to-day -day dishes as well. Um, I think, you know, I, um, we were talking, you know, the, the, the rest of the family was kind of needling me for, you know, I'm always trying to use everything up, right? I'm trying to put together things to use stuff up. As a chef who owned restaurants, um, I abhor waste, right? It's, it's pissing money down the drain, which is not a really good, good business model. Right. Um, but aside from that, there's a moral component to not wasting. So I want to do all of that. Similarly, right, I want to, we should always be eating with the season. And I always want to honor um, those farmers, fishermen, ranchers, artisans who are so passionate about what they do um, that they're putting better things um, in my mise en place. Right. Okay. Why would I want, right. I have, I have first of the season local tomatoes. Why do I want to buy some hothouse tomato from 3000 miles away right now? Um, that's ludicrous on a whole bunch of different levels. Plus it doesn't even taste good. Right. And so, you know, um, $1 back into your local economy translates into three as opposed to sending all the money, you know, uh, across the pond or 3000 miles to California. You know, there's, there's a million reasons why we need to be looking locally. Things taste best, local and in season, by and large. Um, so let's make it easy, right? The easiest way to be a great chef is to start with the best ingredients, right? You're going to see, I'm not, I'm doing almost no cooking here. Um, while I think of it, I don't know if you can hear the sizzle, but I have the um, bass going very, very gently on the skin side. We're just going to leave it, right, uh, over 
low to medium heat right now. We're gonna leave it until that skin, which when you first put it in, um, unless you're using a nonstick pan, which um, I'd sort of argue against here because it doesn't give you that same level of crispness. Um, but if you, I'm using a cast iron in the restaurant. We might use the French black steel or blue steel. Um, but that skin will stick, um, stick, 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 um, just like it would on a grill until you let enough of that uh, skin um, caramelize and brown, and then it will begin to release. So we're just gonna leave it. We're gonna be super patient. As long as the heat is not too high, it won't burn, and we won't get that annoying char. Um, and then it, what we'll be able to do at the last second is just it will immediately release. We'll flip it over, turn off the heat, and let it cook very, very gently. Right. And I don't, not to rush you, but we're, we're edging up for a little past time, but can you give us a little preview? Of Ooh, through the magic of television. Oh, my God. <laughs> right, there we are. What do we do? How do we finish right. it off? <laughs> right. So really nice and crisp and super moist, right? So I'm basically just going to, just going to, Cut that up a little bit, still really nice and moist. And now, oops, we are gonna make a very quick salad. So. Okay. Just a reminder for everyone watching, you will get the recipe for how to do this um, in your thank you or after this segment, it will arrive to you. So if you want this recipe, don't worry, you will get it. Right, so if, you know, you can, you could compose all of this. I'm not a, I don't, I'm not a huge fan of the salad composé because um, I want you to get a little bite of everything in each, in each bite, right? Right, so you can family style. <laughs> over your mouth, all throughout your mouth. Um, some of that. Some of those, some of that. All right, you want a generous amount of salt because we have all of these things in here that are going to contribute watery crunch. So while it may seem like a lot of salt, it really isn't. Crunch up my pita a little bit. This is the quickest salad ever, folks. <laughs> well, it's all about having your uh, your uh, your prep work done. Right, all the mise en place. Right. So. Well, and to your point, Michael, as you're um, composing this salad, I just want to say, you know, the sort of uh, everything you were saying about you know eating local, supporting local farmers. Um, also, I want to mention the work that you're doing actually for restaurants. Um, you can follow his work at, at Mass Restaurants United, um, since we need some restaurant advocacy right now. Um, here, let's show off this beautiful salad that you got. Let's see if I can do this. That's gorgeous. And so, again, I, I've managed to stay relatively cool in the kitchen, which is a big thing when it's a thousand degrees out. Um, and this, as I said, lots of, lots of big, bold flavors, lots of um, big crunchy elements. Um, you've got some flavor and textural contrast going on, all sorts of good stuff. And th this is the sort of thing, you might need a recipe for a couple of components, but you really don't need a recipe, right? Just go to the market, find the stuff that looks great, and boom, instant salad, right? If you've chosen well, uh, season it properly, and put it on a plate neatly, it's gonna be delicious and inherently beautiful in its simplicity, right? That's why I sort of, you know, am very much, uh, don't wanna do the overly manipulated, very composed salad. This is, this is how you'd eat at the table, right? The moment you stick a fork in it, it's gonna get all messed up anyways, right? That's beautiful um, because it's all informed by, you know, flavors of Israel, flavors of, where you are right there and, and of the Jewish diaspora too. So um, I'm gonna wrap us up to keep us on time, Michael, but thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you very much, and, uh, just in terms of mass restaurants, work, order lots of takeout, lots and lots of takeout, help keep restaurants in business, 
um, it's a really precarious time for our industry. So whatever you can do to support restaurants right now is greatly, greatly appreciated. You heard the man, folks. So um, support our restaurants. And um, last but not least, as the Jared's tagline says, let culture connect us. To make this possible, we rely on generous community support like yours. So please consider donating if you like what you've seen. Um, the donate link is in the chat. Our next J Live installments will be on Monday with Joshua Meyer and on Tuesday with uh, Ladino singer, a personal favorite of mine, Sarah Aroeste, so don't miss it. Thank you so much, Michael, and thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Have a very happy Friday evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much. Shabbat shalom.